Hello and welcome to another episode of Cyberspeak with InfoSec Institute. Today's guest is Andrew Wirtkin, CTO at Blue Cat Networks. Among his many jobs and professions, Andrew has extensively worked with the problems of DNS security issues, a topic of great interest to many of our students. So we're going to talk today about some pervasive DNS security concerns, as well as some easy fixes that your security department can take advantage of right now. Andrew Wirtkin leads the product strategy, product management, and engineering teams across Blue Cat's product portfolio. He's also responsible for Blue Cat's research lab focused on innovation, technology roadmap, and vision. Before joining Blue Cat, Andrew built systems focused on the protection of intellectual property across multinational corporations and multi-tier supply chains. He was chief technology officer for PTC following its acquisition of MKS, where he also served as CTO. Prior to that, Andrew was CTO and co-founder of Synapsis Technology. Andrew holds a BA from the University of Pennsylvania and graduated the University of Pennsylvania's Neuroscience Graduate Program. Andrew, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, so let's start out um, with how you got involved with computers and security. Is it true you started in neuroscience before you moved to tech and sort of what moved you uh, from this fairly different path onto the one that you're on now? And first of all, I, I didn't finish the University of Pennsylvania's no. PhD program in neuroscience, which is part of the story. I would like to say it was because I was doing a lot of work in neural networks and followed that to a passion in machine learning and <laughs> you know, it was a natural cause. Yeah. But, but actually, as much as I loved neuroscience, um, what, what I found myself just trying to solve everything with software, very much enjoyed the process of writing software, creating technology, and, uh, and found myself guiding my research based on what I could write in software. And at some point I had an idea and I decided to take a leave of absence from graduate school to see if I can do something with it. And, uh, and through a series of fortunate and unfortunate events really carved out uh, what, what I really reflect on as a, as a great career in technology. So it was just about a passion for software and products. Uh, what, what was it sort of along the way that you said you just kind of kept trying to solve problems uh, using these, these sort of software methods? Like what, was, what were some of the, 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 the problems that you were working in in neuroscience that, that where you said, okay, this isn't, this isn't working for me? Yeah, no, th there were, there were um, for sure, I was, I was working on things like, uh, you know, computer vision and things that, you know, software was the, the, the main domain. But actually what my core research was around was neurodegenerative diseases, specifically mm -hmm. around uh, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And, and we had, uh, I was working in a lab that had a great deal of funding and we had um, some, some amazing like laser microscopes and you'd sit down and this is 1990 one, you know, in, okay. in 1992, and you sit down at this incredibly multi-million dollar microscope and manually move fields and then sit there counting amyloid plaques on the screen, for instance, and there was a serial port and a manual. And, you know, two weeks later and without sleep, you know, I have a pro, you know, wrote software to automatically scan through and then do some image analysis to do the work for me. And that was way more interesting to me than... Yeah than what I was actually doing as, as look, I, the brain's an amazing thing and I'll always be fundamentally um, uh, just, you know, completely unsatiated. I just want to learn more about, but, but just love software. And then transition to, you know, I, I thought I had a business idea. I was incredibly naive. I took a year leave of absence from graduate school. That idea did not work, but I couldn't go back to graduate school. I was on a, a grant and the grant didn't kick in until the year was over. So I took like a contracting job at General Instrument, which was then bought by Motorola. And the next thing I knew, I was in Taipei at their high value, volume manufacturing plant, solving engineering to manufacturing cost overrun issues with the team there by writing software. And I was, I was solving things quickly, you know, as opposed uh, yeah. to this world of research, academic research, which I loved. But, I, you know, there you hope over the span of your career that you make some sort of impact as opposed to you're at a party two weeks later because we've, we've figured out how to deal with millions of dollars of excess and obsolete inventory. So I just like the, um, the power, especially back then, of how quickly you can use software to solve real problems. Now, um, moving along to that, what was your career path uh, to CTO of Blue Cat like? Uh, going away from neuroscience and technology and security, uh, you said you were in Taipei, you were doing 
uh, you know, solving problems over there and stuff. What were some of the other jobs and position and career steps along the way uh, that got you to where you are now? Um, did you have any other major career about faces uh, between then and now other than neuroscience? Too? Yeah, no, a couple. So I, I, I stayed at, at General Instrument and then, then Motorola and, uh, and, and built a lot of software there and built a team there. And I found that I was solving what I thought were some pretty interesting problems, but, uh, but, but I was, I was part of the machine there. And, and, and what I really wanted to do was, was build something for many companies. I wanted to create commercial software. So I, I had uh, come up with what I thought was a pretty good idea and um, was able to work on an agreement uh, with Motorola many, many years ago uh, to help fund the startup um, and then also be customer number one, which was a lesson that stuck with me my entire career, you know, ensuring that you're building technology for, for somebody, for a real user, that, that you, you've a, you know, today we call it lean startup, but, you know, someone to continually test hypotheses with and, and hopefully many companies to continually test hypotheses with as opposed to assuming you're right. And, uh, and so, so I ended up building a, um, a company that sold software to help customers mitigate the risks, doing a whole lot of math around a lot of environmental laws that were creeping into electronics, like end-of-life vehicle and the restriction of hazardous substances, getting lead and hexchrome and cadmium and other substances concerned out of the supply chain, which is a, a fairly difficult thing to do, especially in electronics, because most OEMs, most companies don't build their own products. They're different components are built all around the world. And, and that led to, um, you know, extending that to things like uh, carbon footprint analysis and, and some other ways to analyze the supply chain. Um, I ended up selling that company to, to this company, PTC, in 2008-ish, uh, and, um, and, then, and then ended up working with this other company that you mentioned, my bio, MKS, um, who was, again, focused very heavily on um, uh, product manufacturers, driving innovation via software. There's a major change in the amount of software engineers versus mechanical or electronic engineers hired at, at, uh, at companies from, it's, it's Mark Andreessen's software eating the world. I mean, when automotive suppliers hire 20,000 software engineers and, and no more mechanical and electric, you know, electronic engineers, you get, you get a very, a change in a dynamic and and, uh, and so I joined a company where we're very much focused on that. That company was also acquired by PTC. So at that point, I became its, its, uh, its CTO. When I was at PTC the second time, I was always focused on building complex software to manage engineering processes and very focused on the protection of uh, intellectual property and especially across uh, global uh, you know, geographical boundaries and across supply chains. And, uh, but the second time I was at PTC as their CTO, I was, I was, you know, as the CTO of a public software company, I had access to and the ability to have some great conversations with the CTOs of our customers, the John Deere's of the world and the Airbuses of the world and, and understanding where they're trying to invest and where they were putting their, their R and D. Uh, and, and, and a lot of that was in, in what we'd call today industrial IOT. Back then it was just their product strategy, but it was, you know, John Deere moving from selling tractors to selling high-tech agricultural farming solutions that, that uh, where, where, you know, tractors are autonomous and they're constantly measuring soil quality. And, and you know, ultimately, uh, John Deere wants to sell crop yield, not tractors. And that requires bridging my enterprise with things I might not even own anymore. These tractors are IP connected. They're streaming data back. Who owns that data? How do we secure it? We can do over the air firmware updates and what that sort of that's my sort of break into this world I'm in now but it's it's you know as I talk to these companies they were struggling certainly on the R&D side and lots of opportunity in the R&D side but the other area they were struggling heavily was um, you know my my uh, the boundaries of my network of what's my company and what's the internet or what's my company and what's my customers networks are starting to dissolve they're starting to change mm -hmm. And so how do I think about security now? Um, and how do I bridge, you know, IT and OT? How do I, how do I um, uh, you know, continue to participate with the product I sold a customer in, in a way where I can continue to gain, you know, intelligence about how it's being used, what it's doing, so that I can build better data-driven strategies 
and provide better solutions to my customers, but how do I leverage IT? How do I leverage my network, my technology to do that? And uh, really start deep diving down in that. Uh, the, the, you know, somewhere along the lines, um, the, uh, the CEO of Blue Cat, who is uh, a former colleague of mine, we worked together and sold this company, MKS, together, um, you know, was starting, he was at Blue Cat already, and he was telling me about Blue Cat, and at some point, the, the sort of, what I was interested in, what he was trying to do aligned appropriately. And I love being at companies this size. I, I had a great time at PTC. I hope I had a great impact there. But big public company versus company where, where um, I can um, create a higher impact. This is what, what excites me. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, being able to help uh, transform a company into different types of markets is very exciting for me. So I, I happily came here about uh, four and a half, five years ago and, and I've been here ever since. Well, great. Um, so one of the things Blue Cat specifically deals with is DNS security, and that's mainly the focus that I want to have for today's yeah. interview. So let's start with a big philosophical question about DNS security. Uh, why, in your opinion, has full adoption and implementation of the, the DMARC, the Domain-Based Methods Authentication Reporting and Conformance Anti-Phishing Standard, been slower than anticipated, or has it been slower than anticipated? Sometimes I think if we can just um, stop using email altogether, uh, <laughs> yeah, my life would be easier, sure. and, uh, and the lives of security professionals would be easier. But but that's that's obviously not going to happen. Yeah, of course, is out of the barn on that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, you, you can ask the question about DMARC. You can ask the question about DNSSEC. You can ask it's you know there there's some level always of um, uh, setting it up isn't specifically complex. But who's authorized to send mail on my behalf? What are my IPs? Set up policies. Um, uh, you know, what is the impact of inbound and outbound? It, there's there's a there's a change management life cycle there that has some level of complexity, and it's one of the systems where where you know it it, it broad broad adoption is what makes it work. You know, and and so I, I think. Some level of it is complexity or not. I like, for instance, uh, many, many organizations are moving to Office 365 or G Suite for mail. Mm -hmm. um, why isn't it a mandatory process as I bring my domain on? If I'm, if I'm just using uh, Office 365 as a, a, you know, adopting their domain, no problem. But if I'm bringing my domain there, there's work for me to do. Well, part of that work is in what they can't control, which is my DNS but maybe they should enforce that I make those changes to my DNS so that, so that it, it is more broadly adopted. Um, so I just think there's, there's um, you know, I don't think it, it's anything specific to the solution. Hmm. Uh, I think it's more just around um, uh, in, enforcement. And, you know, if, if um, and yeah, I think it's, it's, I think it's roughly around that. Yeah. 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 So um, to that end, what are some of the biggest DNS security weaknesses or maybe just the one biggest DNS security weakness currently being exploited by hackers? As far as you can tell. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, so I don't know that there's a one and let me explain it this way. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the one certainly the market is, is very interested in is for instance, DNS tunneling. Okay. Uh, if I can use DNS as a mechanism to have a conversation, exfiltrate data, do command to control, and I don't have any controls in my organization that's looking at DNS. I might have a well-architected DNS so people can't go out to resolvers on their own and all floods through some server in the DMZ. I might control the flow of traffic, but I may not be doing that inspection. So, uh, or, or a lot of our customers believe they've segmented networks, for instance, but DNS ends up being a bridge with things like tunneling. So th there's a lot of concern around tunneling certainly in, in the customer base. Mm -hmm. um, the way I look at it is a little bit differently though, which is um, DNS is being um, such a, a control point for connectivity and internet connectivity. Um, it, it is used by, by those trying to compromise because they're trying to build highly available backend systems that are scalable that aren't easy to take down. So they're using DNS the way it was intended to use DNS quite often. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest hole is, uh, from my perspective, is um, allowing, allowing um, uh, you know, 
not not inspecting the traffic because it, it again it's being used the way it was intended in many cases but but we're just sort of naively sending it out or naively answering queries i, I would say dns is like a, a chump you know it, it tries its hardest to give the right answer to every question until its resources are exhausted and falls over right but it's doing its job and and i think that's the biggest risk with dns is that it's um it's so um it's a chump hmm. wow that's uh that'll be the uh the pull quote of this uh, <laughs> of this video um so I, I mean it sounds like you're kind of moving in that direction already um saying you know using these services that you know use dns what it's you know the way it's meant to be used but what would you say are some easy fix solutions to common DNS security issues that you're surprised more security departments don't take advantage of. Is that, is that one example? One example for sure is just simply allowing DNS traffic out um, with, with, uh, with, without any inspection or any policy at all, mm. or, um, you know, you know, at the very least companies should have some sort of response policy. So, you know, if I know, if I subscribe to threat intelligence or I get some threat intelligence from my vendor and I know certain domains are bad out there, then don't let people resolve those queries. It's a highly efficient way to block access. Uh, I've not created any, so, you know, I haven't tried to create a TCP connection out somewhere. I, I've blocked it with very little data exchanged on the network. Highly, highly efficient. So there, there's some bare minimums people should be doing for sure. Um, but, but, you know, wholly a big part of it's around visibility. How can I access this data? Um, it, how can I access the data correctly so I have client attribution and I know who is trying to do what? And, and if I can gather that, then how can I add more context? How can I, um, you know, if I know it's a point of sale machine and I know that point of sale machine should only be looking up 83 different DNS queries, and the 84th is google.com, pull it out of the wall. It's compromised because I know what it's supposed to be doing. So there's mm -hmm. so much more that can be done with DNS, but at the very least, um, you know, uh, uh, enterprises, people should have some visibility into the DNS traffic because there is, there's uh, such rich signals in that data, both in terms of um, you know, the, the intent of the devices and in many cases, the the uh, actual you know communication of those devices. Okay, so um, let's sort of move one level up and sort of talk about general strategies for your organization. Say you're an organization uh, that you know worst case scenario has just been hit by one or a series of DOS or DDoS attacks, and you realize that your DNS security strategy is severely lacking. So, what are some rudimentary solutions you can implement immediately for low cost and quick implementation? That would let you until you can harden your DNS strategy. What would something you could do today that would, uh, you know, inc increase your security strength until you can sort of build it up in a in a larger way? Yeah. So when we, when we think of uh, any sort of denial of service, we think of it, you know, inside out or outside in. So mm -hmm. from the outside in perspective, there's some, uh, you know, distributed attack, uh, denial of service attack. You know, specifically in this case, targeted at your DNS. Um, then then you need scale and you're, you're not going to get scale if you're housing some DNS servers in your, your company. You know, there, and there's many, many solutions out there to provide uh, global scale to DNS. And, and, and we suggest a combination of using um, a service as well as have some servers because somebody might attack that service for a reason, nothing to do with you, right. cause issues with that service. And you, you, need, you need two different strategies there. Um, it, the, the, and so for sure, you, you should have some uh, cloud scale of your external DNS so mm -hmm. that, so that it, it, it can't be taken down so easily. And there, there's lots of companies, we have a service, but lots of companies who have services to do just that. Um, the, the, the more interesting one, at least from our perspective, is the inside out one, which is okay. um, either, either to take you down or because some devices on your network got infected with I don't know, like the, Mirai was a good example of it a couple of years ago. And so now unwittingly you are participating in a DDoS attack on somebody else because something, some malware has been installed on one of your devices that's generating a ton of DNS queries. One, you don't want to be unwittingly um, part of that attack, but two, eventually that's going to take down your external recursor. Like eventually 
you're not gonna be able to send DNS queries out anymore, so it's gonna harm your company. And that's an area where we don't see a lot of people looking for that on their you know, internal side. And so there, there has to be, beyond just some visibility, um, there needs to be the appropriate monitoring of DNS. It, it, it's not that complicated to do. Uh, where are the anomalies? What am I seeing now that I didn't see before? And then so that I can cut it off. Now, do you think in general, most enterprise organizations don't take the concept of DNS security seriously enough? Uh, and, you know, are there time and resources? You know, why do you think the time and resources aren't being applied to these problems the way we do to sort of more glamorous or easily solvable issues? Um, well, I think, I think one of it, um, and it's one of the ways I look at this market. I mean, we're, we're, we're a DNS company. That's what we do. We're yeah. not a security company. We're not, a, I mean, we are a DNS company. We're, we're highly relevant to, to cybersecurity. We're highly relevant to networking. We're highly relevant to servers and cloud deployment of technology. We're relevant across the board. Right. And, uh, and so, um, so you need us there's whether it's blue cat, one of our competitors or open source or some free software, if you're running a company at any sort of scale, you have a solution to DNS. And so we believe wholeheartedly that you should leverage what you need already, as opposed to putting a bunch of other things on your network that may provide similar capabilities, may provide different capabilities, but we find a lot of uh, weariness in the buyers of buying thing after thing after thing, using a bit of each and not necessarily building a comprehensive defense and depth strategy, but rather um, a bit of a hodgepodge because vendors come in there um, potentially overselling what they can do. So I don't know if this makes sense or not, but a bit of it is it, it's, a, it's a fairly simple and robust way to increase your security posture, but, but um, you know, it's not, it's not the next best thing. It's something you already have, you know, so it's right. this odd position. And now, it, look, uh, there's mechanisms and more mechanisms now to encrypt DNS to make it, but by and large in enterprises, this stuff is not encrypted. It's right there. Um, there's lots of companies out there that try to harvest this data passively inside of an enterprise to help a company do something with it. But, but DNS as a control point is very powerful. Hmm. And finally, and I think very importantly, the number one requirement for DNS inside of an enterprise is reliability and uptime of service. And that's hard to achieve. Like it takes operators to achieve that. We believe we make it easier for our customers, but it's still, it's the number one requirement. If DNS is not available, compute stops working, that's bad. And so there's also a um, hesitancy to augment a DNS deployment architecture in any way that might disrupt its availability. Uh, well, to that end, um, could you tell me a little bit about BlueCat's DNS Edge, which does DNS monitoring? How does it work and, and what processes does it use to remediate cyber attacks? Yeah, so our, our, our Edge product is, um, is, is really, it, it's all about the first hop. I mean, we, we, believe, we believe there's a lot of value that we can achieve uh, the closer we are to clients. And so um, as that first hop in the DNS chain, um, we, we can, one, harvest all that data and harvest it in a way where we naturally have client attribution so that, uh, that we can look for anomalies per, per device as opposed to you know, in, in a fire hose of DNS data. So get it closer to the clients so that we can put policies around things like networks or types of devices. So Edge is a product that is a, um, it's a, it's a highly innovated DNF server that's able to um, uh, process rules around the query stream coming through it so that we can look for, identify uh, specific types of, of data that may or may not be threats, but also do stuff that's very DNS-y, uh, there's nothing to do with cyber, and basically synthesize responses based on context as opposed to simply just going back to a zone file and getting an answer. And, and maybe that was too low level, but basically we're gonna provide all that visibility to DNS data. We'll make sure, I don't care if there's trillions of queries or billions of queries, we'll make all that data available and then we have a platform where we're doing the appropriate analytics on that data so that we can um, generate the value around cyber. And then also we can deploy policies and, and, uh, and those policies are critical to make DNS as a control point inside that network as well. 
Um, I believe you are about to host a webinar, or maybe you already have titled "Looking for Threats in a DNS Dumpster Dive." Is there? Could you give us a little sneak preview? What uh, as people harvest their DNS server data, log data in search of anomalies or red flags, uh, what sorts of things should they be looking for? Yeah, I, you know, it's it's part part of what we're trying to solve for with DNS Edge was uh, we have a lot of customers or companies I know that dump all of their data in their SIM or somewhere. They're, they're trying to harvest the DNS data today and they get overwhelmed because there's a ton of it and mm -hmm. most of it looks fine. So how do I start? And, and so this will be the first in a series of webinars and this one probably is going to be the most rudimentary. In other words, this one's more of a scatter. Here's the different places to start looking. And we go through some basic concepts like, you know, um, DNS query types and and what are normal query types and what are abnormal query types, especially in the context? Like why are, why are these devices on, on, on networks that are provisioned for end user clients looking up MX records? They're not mail senders. They shouldn't be looking up those, those records, you know, as an example. Mm -hmm. um, also though, we do break down like what is DNS tunneling, go through actual tunneling exercises, talk about what the hallmarks of those might look like. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be talking about, I think, uh, uh, domain-generated algorithms as well. So, so why, um, you know, uh, um, how how uh, domains can be generated algorithmically, and therefore uh, malware can keep sort of evolving as domains may or net may be blocked, and you know, find that combination of domain that's live on the internet that isn't blocked, so I can go communicate outside of the company, and and sort of look for some of the hallmarks of that. Um, but we'll be looking at real DNS data. Um, uh, you know, I tried to keep the, the, the marketing slides, you know, rectangles with words in them, pointing to other rectangles with words in them sure. to a minimum. But, um, but again, I, I, we'll follow this up with some deeper dives in some of those areas as well. Very cool. So to wrap things up a little bit here, as DNS attacks get more sophisticated or complex or prominent or prevalent, um, where are the next wave of DNS attacks coming from? What should organizations be doing now to prepare for the future? Well, for sure, I mean, it really it depends on the context that text. We're big proponents of, especially on the, well, on the external side, um, DNSSEC, um, sign, sign, sign. Um, you know, we, we obviously believe a, a great deal in, in making DNS data visible. Um, making it harvestable so that it can be used as part of a cyber strategy, whether it's with our product or somebody else's product or your own data lake or you're stuffing in Splunk, this stuff is important to look at mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and start modeling for anomalies. Um, you know, I, I, a average end user compute device does uh, 2,300 queries per day and over a month looks at 3,000 different queue names. The, the, it's not hard to spot anomalies if you have access to the data. The, the averages, the norms become pretty clear. Okay. So it sounds like um, a lot of it is, is sort of intuitive as much as tech-based. Yeah, no, for sure. And look, I'm skipping over, a, a, like, I mean, a proper enterprise yeah. DNS architecture is critical. Like, do right. I have a hardened infrastructure? Mm -hmm. uh, who's allowed to send queries outside of the enterprise? There, there's a lot of hygiene that must occur, and in many cases, we don't even see that hygiene. But but by and large, large enterprises, enterprises, the hygiene will be there. Mm -hmm. um, th they're just they're not taking the next step. But absolutely, you know, look at the DNS data flows inside of your organization and understand if there's a weaknesses in the deployment architecture. Is there? It's not hard to construct a DNS deployment architecture inside of an enterprise that is fairly fail-proof where there's available DNS servers for the clients and, and, and you know, the ability to ensure that if any node fails, I'm still okay. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure DNS is survivable, make sure it's hardened. Mm -hmm. um, it, so there's a great deal of, of, of basic policies and, and we certainly work with our customers to help them create that hygiene. Um, but outside of that, um, you know, if, from our perspective, it, it, it's all around visibility so that I can harvest that information. Um, I can marry that information with other data sources. How old are these domains? How long have they been in the internet, on the internet? Do these domains represent any sort of risk? There are some top level domains out there that are, are brutal. I mean, they are, they are you know, where 90% of the seen domains are, are related to spam or, or malware. Like, 
take the basic steps. Don't, you know, look at your risk profile. Um, and if your risk profile is anything other than Wild West inside of an organization, then, then block those. You know, it's, so there's, there's a lot of basic things that can be done as well. Uh, Andrew, thank you for joining us today. This was very informative. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. All right. And thank you all for listening and watching. Uh, if you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more of them on our YouTube page. Just go to YouTube and type in InfoSec Institute. To check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts, including this one. Please visit InfoSecInstitute.com slash Cyberspeak for the full list of episodes. If you'd like to qualify for a free pair of headphones with a class sign-up, podcast listeners can go to infosecinstitute.com slash podcast to learn more about the special offer. And if you'd like to try our free security IQ package, which includes phishing simulators you can use to fake fish and then educate your friends and colleagues in the ways of security awareness, please visit infosecinstitute.com slash security IQ. Thanks once again to Andrew Wirtkin of Blue Cat, and thank you all again for watching and listening. We'll speak to you next week. <laughs>